Hello, everyone. It's Wednesday, April 5th. Today on The Final Bar, we'll be talking with Tony Dwyer of Canaccord Genuity. We'll see how he is trying to make sense of this macroeconomic environment. A lot of question marks remain. Distribution in the short term yesterday, continuing today with a defensive sector, utilities, at the top of the list. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hey everyone, welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. It's great to be with you today and every day after the close, particularly today as we're back live in our studio here in Redmond, Washington, trying to help you make sense of these markets, trying to show how we can apply the technical toolkit to better quantify what is happening, really quantify investor psychology as manifested in uh, stock and ETF prices. We have a lot to unpack today with sort of a defensive feel to the tape, uh, utilities, healthcare at the top of the returns list, some of the offensive sectors like technology, industrials, consumer names struggling today. What does this mean? How does today's move fit into the big picture? That's what we try to do every day on the show, and we'll try to help make those connections with you. Interesting to see how some of the names, particularly in industrials and materials, really pushing lower. If this is a raging bull market, I would argue charts like Deer and Caterpillar and Albemarle and others probably aren't doing what they're doing right now. Let's look at those charts together here as we get into our market recap, and let's look at what happened today in the major equity indexes. We'll start with the S&P 500, down about a quarter of a percent, while the Dow is up a quarter of a percent. The Nasdaq is lower, and this is how a defensive day probably feels on average with the leadership, sort of the technology communications leadership that is embedded in the Nasdaq, uh, you know, down while the uh, the more, uh, I guess, blue chip sort of defensive nature of the Dow Industrial is able to scratch out uh, a day in the green. The Nasdaq composite, by the way, just below 12,000. The Nasdaq 100, just below 13,000. So we're sort of right below teasing those big round numbers, but unable to follow through. And I was talking with my guest today, Tony Dwyer, before we went live on the show, we talked about that lack of upside follow through, which I, I think is a, a really key uh, way to, to focus on or, or really key message of the markets, right? In a bull market phase, stocks don't just trade to resistance, they trade through resistance and additional buyers come in to push the market higher. You're not really seeing that for now. Uh, we had that bearish engulfing pattern or bearish outside day on the S&P, continuing with a little move to the downside. Uh, the VIX is moving a little bit higher. Still, I would argue, in the, in the general category of low volatility, which is below 20. Uh, when that happens, that basically indicates that, you know, while, while markets certainly are choppy, and, and don't get me wrong, we have plenty of volatility out there, but the VIX measuring uh, uh, volatility using the S&P options market uh, currently around 19. Let's look at some other asset classes very uh, very briefly here and see what we can learn. Interest rates overall came down yesterday, and you're seeing more of that today. Bond prices moving higher. The TLT, the AG, some of those uh, big uh, bond ETFs are testing resistance right now. Very, very close to making a new swing high. We'll try to check out those charts here in our market recap as, uh, as time permits. And the dollar index up by about a third of a percent. Commodities a bit mixed overall. Gold and silver actually flat for the day, uh, but the broader commodity space uh, using the DBC, which is a broader commodity ETF, uh, up a little bit. Natural gas and actually gasoline uh, prices both went higher today, uh, helping sort of the energy side of the uh, of the commodity space. But overall, I would say mixed with a number of those key ones like gold and silver, which really moved higher uh, in recent uh, weeks and uh, in the last month or so, uh, sort of treading water for the moment. Finally, cryptocurrencies, a bit of a mix uh, returns here as well. Bitcoin essentially flat from yesterday. Now, overall, the last couple of days have been pretty positive for uh, for Bitcoin and especially positive for Ether prices. Now above 1900, we're getting closer and closer to that 
2,000 levels. Two days ago, we're, we're doing the show and we're down around 1,800. We're continuing to move higher and, and big round numbers have often been really important. Just look at a chart of Bitcoin and put a horizontal line every 10,000 points and you'll see how often that becomes an important level to uh, pay attention to. So within the cryptocurrency space, I think a really interesting um, you know, uh, uh, performance, uh, I guess, indicator where they have uh, performed well and actually held up while a lot of equities and, and some of the equity indexes have struggled to uh, hold some of their previous gains year to date. Let's dig into some of those high level points in a little more detail. And we'll start with the daily chart of the S&P 500. Here we're looking back for the last uh, year and a couple months or so, going back to the beginning of 2022, really showing that downtrend in the major indexes. And then really the October low, then a series of higher lows, right? So Charles Dow's basic definition, we've said this how many times a week, higher highs and higher lows is an uptrend, lower lows and lower highs is a downtrend. So what are we seeing right now for the S&P? To be honest with you, a little unclear, right? If you had to, if I had to pick one or the other, I would say overall we're seeing higher lows, which is encouraging. Um, I would say the December low, uh, the March low, is basically a retest of that December low. So while we're not necessarily make, making a significant higher low, at least we're holding it. We're not breaking down by any means. But what's concerning to me right now is the S&P broke above 4,100 going into the end of last week. And when that happens, we talked about follow through, right? A strong market, a bullish phase, you don't just get up to a 4,100 level, right? A key resistance level, you actually go higher. And the way that that happens, just think of it logically, what's gonna cause asset prices to go higher? Less supply or higher demand, that's sort of economics 101, but right, additional buyers, additional buying power, additional demand for, uh, for shares is what causes things to go higher. You're actually seeing the, the opposite. You're seeing what we might call an exhaustion of buyers, a bearish engulfing pattern on an outside day yesterday, uh, a little bit of a, of a pullback again today. So the question I think that still remains through the remainder of this week going into the, the long holiday weekend and into next week is if we get that follow through, can the S&P get above 4,100 and stay there for today for what it's worth not how I would describe this market. I would describe a market that's failing to follow through after a move to the upside. So I don't think anything has really changed, right? As, we, as we've shared a number of times here, the s and is at the same level it was in early February, pretty much the same level it was in late November, the same level it was in September of last year, August of last year, June, May. These are all the times we've been right about at the same level. So this overall, I would say, is a market in a consolidation phase. And we're seeing that reflected in some of the movement of the individual stocks and ETFs that we will uh, get to uh, here momentarily. When we're looking at our dashboard, just thinking about what's happened uh, again today, three sectors sort of uh, uh, outperforming everything else. It's sort of like the top three and then a big list of, uh, of the others. Utilities up 2.6% today, healthcare up 1.7%. Energy up one and a half percent. So, you know, thinking of each of these in order, utilities are showing a lot of strength. I was scanning for stocks making new three month highs and three month lows for my market misbehavior premium members earlier today. One of the things I noted is they're number one, about even between new swing highs and new swing lows over the last week, right? So, uh, about the same number, no real differentiation one side or the other. But a lot of utilities, the number one sector for new swing highs this week. Utilities. Now, that is not a feel good, check the butt bullish, uh, you know, uh, item sort of a result. That is more of a uh, not not a great read uh, if you're bullish because people are rotating to the more defensive side of the ledger. That's usually not what sustained bull markets are made of. Utilities can perform in, well in a, in a bull market phase. Go back to 2014 if you want to see what that looks like, where utes and real estate were actually the top sectors in a bullish year. But it's pretty rare, right? That's the, that's the exception, not the rule. In general, defense leading is not a great sign for stocks. Healthcare, you're seeing a lot of pharma like J&J &J with some big moves higher. Energy, we're seeing some of the beaten down names from yesterday. Things like Valero and MPC and Philips 66 and so forth. Uh, popping to uh, to the upside. The underperforming sectors, consumer discretionary down 2%, industrials down 1.3%, technology down 1.2%. So two of the fangy of the fang sectors, uh, tech and consumer discretionary at the lower end of the return list today. That's not a great, uh, not a great sign overall for upside follow through. And then industrials. Let's hit on just an example chart or two in each of those. Uh, before we do that though, I just want to touch briefly on the fixed income market. So I'm going to talk with today's guest, Tony Dwyer, and just as a setup from a technical perspective, it's striking to me when we think about what's happening with support and resistance levels, right? It's all about when we get to support or we get to resistance, what happens next? The TLT is testing a key resistance level. It's at the same level it was in December, January, and March. 
Do we have enough momentum this time to go higher? What does a rally in bonds from here tell you about market conditions overall? The ag, by the way, which is sort of bond, uh, treasuries and corporate bonds all mixed together in a big ETF, has already actually broken to a new uh, a new swing high. So might be interesting to see if we get follow through the remainder of the year, uh, the remainder of the week. At this point, it's testing resistance one, once again. I mentioned the weakness that we're seeing in industrials and a chart like John Deere uh, popped up on my list yesterday because it was down after and making a, you know, a jump up to 420. It's dropping pretty good uh, yesterday. And the question is always when you have a big move is what happens to the next day, right? Once investors sort of lick their wounds or digest whatever happened, then what's next, right? What's what, when, when we've had a chance to close and sort of reinitiate uh, an overall move in the, uh, in the stock. Deer opening once again and then trading lower. So gapping lower at the open, now closing below its 200-day moving average for the first time since October. So a, a stock that had been making a new swing high going into year end retested resistance in January as the S&P is having a pretty decent month. Deer was actually struggling. As the S&P is making a new swing high in February, Deer and a lot of other industrials are down. Now Deer is making lower lows and a lower high once again here at 420. That's not a great, uh, not a great sign, I would say, for the sector and just also for the conditions. Charts like Caterpillar are actually holding the 200-day for now, and, and that's why I think there's still a bit of a question mark, right? You have names that are rallying to resistance and faltering. Now we have charts like Deer breaking down, Caterpillar testing support, and the question is whether we're able to hold. And it's not just that, right? Home Depot is a name I like to look at because it's just sort of a good average U.S. stock to think about as you're, uh, as you're analyzing things. Look at what's happened on the chart of Home Depot. Clear support at 310 in December and January and February. We gapped lower and haven't looked back. A day later, we're below the 200-day moving average. Now we're trading up to the 200-day and failing to hold it. That is a real classic, actually bearish rotation where the stock breaks down, retests resistance, and then fails with the momentum remaining fairly negative. That concerns me about the health of the market underneath the hood with stocks like Home Depot failing to hold resistance. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll talk with my guest, Tony Dwyer of Canaccord Genuity. We'll see you in a minute. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Final Bar. I'm Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It is such a pleasure to put on, put on the show for you. Excited to be back in the studio. Excited for a lot of really cool things to come from Stock Charts TV and The Final Bar here in the uh, coming weeks and months. I'm gonna bring on today's guest, Tony Dwyer, here on a few moments. First, I wanna make a couple brief announcements uh, just to let you know, uh, upcoming, uh, let's see, uh, the mailbag. <laughs> the mailbag, we have to think about the mailbag. Monday, we're gonna do another mailbag session. We had a really good mailbag actually at the end of last week and beginning of this week. You can email us your questions at thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at finalbarsctv. And we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We would love to hear from you. We'll answer your question in our next mailbag, which will be coming up on Monday's show. Just to let you know, uh, let you know about the upcoming schedule on the final bar. Great guest today, Tony Dwyer. Uh, tomorrow on Thursday, April 6th, we have Joe Rabel, founder of Rabel Stock Research. He is a stock picker through and through with a big technical component to his process. We'll see what stocks are looking interesting in this sort of environment. I think it might be a challenging time to pick stocks. We'll see what he can come up with. As, uh, market holiday on Friday for Good Friday. Wish everyone a happy uh, Easter and a, and a good holiday weekend. We will be off on Friday, but we will be sharing a special uh, uh, episode called Investing with Multiple Time Frames. We asked some of our fellow Stock Charts TV hosts to share their thoughts about how they apply multiple time frames. What does that mean in their analytical approach? I'll share some charts as well from my own toolkit. Should be a really good way to uh, set yourself up for the holiday weekend, thinking about how you're using some of those charting tools. And a mailbag coming up again on Monday, April 10th. I want to bring on today's guest, Tony Dwyer. Tony's the Chief Market Strategist at Canaccord Genuity, coming to us from the New York area. Tony, great to see you. How are you these days? Great to be with you, Dave. Uh, doing well, doing well. A little bit a little bit nutty with the market, but doing well. Nutty is a very appropriate way of describing what, I, what I'm seeing and hearing. I think you're, you're experiencing the same. Let's get to some of the charts and, and, and some interesting tables, actually, that you brought along with you, Tony. We're starting with sort of this issue, right? We're coming through sort of this mini banking crisis, financial crisis, however we want to talk about. Talk to us about what you've seen over the last couple of weeks and what it might mean for what's coming next. Dave, as you know, I, I love it when um, something dramatic happens and we in the strategy and, of course, media community, you know, mention it without any follow through. So here's the follow through. <laughs> as of March 9th, um, the BKX, the KBW Bank Stock Index, was down 
four percent over a three-day period. It's, this is a three-day rate of change. I was really surprised to see that that's only happened five times before since you've had a KBW bank stat. The BKX index has been around. In all of those cases, you rallied. Your minimum rally was 4.94% from uh, the signal date, which also happened to be the low each time. So when, we, when you look at um, from the low, I think the S&P going through Monday was up 6.6%. So we're pretty close, right? You always rally, you've always rallied when you get a banking, the onset of a banking crisis. Unfortunately, we call this the bounce then trounce. You know, I love my titles. Um, <laughs> the bounce then trounce because you get the bounce and then ultimately every time you've gone back. The only time you didn't break the low on a closing basis was 1998 but you broke it about 4% intraday. That was the swoon of um, of the long-term capital management crisis. So the banks tank initially because there's this crisis feeling like the system's gonna fail and then like everybody's like, okay, we're okay. <laughs> and then you get the reality of what it means to lending. It's so interesting, right? So sort of the movement that we've seen with the big drop in, in banks, sort of that initial, what I guess what, what, what this evidence would show is sort of like the counter trend bounce. And then it tends to be a little bit, little bit more painful uh, going forward, right? Get, let's get into some of the uh, evidence that sort of back ups, backs up where we're at, particularly this recessionary period, the R word. Talk us through some of these charts and what it tells you about the conditions here. Yeah. The whole point of this, let's put the system failure up on a mantelpiece. <laughs> And let's just say it's not going to fail because I don't think it will. What I want to look at is what's the cause of a real bear market that stays weak? And it comes down to economic output. You go into a recession, Dave. So our call and, and you need money to an improvement in the outlook for money to come out of that recession based bear market. So this chart that you have in front of you, because there's private lending and private equity and hedge fund lending and online lending, non Fed related lending, I think we have to look at all yield curves that exist. Mm -hmm. So this chart that you have in front of you, provided from uh, our friends at Ned Davis, is the percentage of yield curves that are signaling a 2023, uh, the percentage of yield curves that are inverted. So if you look at all possible yield curves between three months and 30 years, mm. whenever 55% of them have gone inverted, you've gone into recession every time. We got to 93.3. <laughs> right. And the reason that's important is it creates that shutdown of money. Interesting. So it seems fairly likely the recession is happening. It's sort of engaged. And uh, and, and that's sort of the, the experience we're going to be having. What does this mean? Now, let's look at some other evidence here and particularly what that means for lending standards. I, I think your next chart is a really interesting one. Right. So if you're if you're a bank, let's, let's put away all the silliness we do in this business. And let's talk about common sense. You work at a bank, you're running their lending area, right? Would you lend money to lose money? And the answer is no. And that's what an inverted yield curve does. So that right there shuts down lending. The only money you're going to lend is like really high interest rates loan, which have a higher default rate assumption, right? So this chart that you have in front of you on the top half is from the Federal Reserve. That is lending standards. When the lines are going up, small and large business law, uh, lending standards are tightening, meaning banks don't want to give them out or they want to give them out at a lesser rate. Anytime that black and red line has been worth the current level, this is previous to the Silicon Valley Bank and regional bank issue. You've been in a recession or about to go into a recession every time. So we got the yield curve inversions are making the banks less willing to lend. And if you go to the next chart, that's going to see We're going to see what the result is. Here you go, Dave. Mm. A shutdown of money. Right now, people would say when I look at they look at this chart and I say, well, yeah, for the first time in history, you've seen a negative year over year change in money supply post World War Two. The obvious point that I would make is, well, duh, it went up more than it ever did in history. But in America, we all know what we do, at least in the Dwyer household, when we're given money and it comes cheap, we spend it. <laughs> we love to spend it. So the money supply ramp there is what created the inflation and the positive economic output. That money's been spent. So if you're going to grow out of a recession, if you're going to grow out of even an economic slowdown, you need an improvement in the outlook for money. The inversion of the yield curve still, the lending standards in a recessionary level, and money flow being negative suggests that there isn't a great... 
Why do stocks bottom in the midst of a recession? It's because the Fed is raising is lowering rates aggressively enough to steepen the yield curve. So they're making money to lend again. Mm. So that enables investors to look through the coming economic weakness because they know the outlook for money is improving. That's not the case today with the Fed still staying tight. So it's so interesting, Tony. I mean, as, as I'm looking at some of these charts, these are fascinating just to see how the world has evolved here. But we have the inverted deal curve, you know, uh, tightening lending standards, money supply going negative. But the market has been rallying in the face of that evidence here recently. So what, what do we make of that disconnect between the major <laughs> averages market, sort of testing resistance, right? Dave, I, I, I loved your lead in <laughs> to the show. What market? Literally, as I look at my screen today, through the close of trading today, half, more than half of the S&P sectors are negative on the year. Mm. And it's not just the interest rates. I said, once we got the financials, duh, we got um, healthcare, utilities, energy, real estate, industrials. Consumer staples is only up 0.99%. Yeah. So with the S&P up 6.5%, you know where that action's happening. And it's in those mega cap stocks. So let's look below the indices um, and look at the real breadth of the market not and not just get focused on what the index is doing now. So when you look up all those charts we talked about and the Fed and the yield curve and money, it all it all suggests it's always suggested a recession. Maybe it's different this time. I'm going to go with human. I'm going to go with human nature and history. But, you know, um, you've n every you've n never in, since the S&P has been a 500 stock index made the low prior to the start of a recession. So if we go into a recession this year um, or even next year, you would expect that you're going to make another low. We're a year and a half into it. Dave, you know, none of these charts happen at the beginning of a at the beginning of a problem. They happen toward the tail end. Banking crisis happen toward the tail end. So we want to use that next leg lower to really attack the market and get a lot more uh, aggressive as long as the Fed is cooperating. So when you think about how the market's evolved here um, in 2023 so far, it's been sort of hit. You know, I feel like it's been an up month, a down month, up month, down month. But but overall, it's netted out to a fairly weak performance for most of the sectors. Right. Save a couple that have been pretty decent. How have with what you've seen, does that change your perspective about what 2023 may hold uh, the trajectory of the Fed with, uh, with with what's happened with the with the banks? Has that changed at all? Or do you think we're still sort of in this inverted yield curve recessionary period challenging market environment going forward. I, I think we're going to be in that. If you could pull up the, I want to talk to something. This isn't a comment on deer. Pull up that deer chart you had. Yeah. And you're right. You're right. When you, the industrials, the problem, pull up a weekly. Can you pull up a weekly? Any, of course. Any chance? This is a first for us, right? All right. So look at what happened in, um, let's call it April of 2022. Yep. Absolute broke out that breakout that failed. Yeah. You can you blew up above that triple top there, right? So then what happened in June, July of 2022? It broke down. Yeah. Well, that failed too, because then you rallied. This is an illiquid tape. This is a human mm. nature tape. To me, you know, and again, this isn't a comment on deer, it's a comment on chasing our tails. You need to have a, an improved outlook of money to have a conviction that we can look through any coming economic weakness. So what we've seen so far year to date, I, I guess, and really since the October lows, it's sort of turned into this very, uh, you know, very narrow uh, group of stocks that are doing particularly well. Technology, particularly semiconductors, still holding up very, very well. Gold, that, you know, that part of material, sort of the gold precious metal trade sort of working. Where do you look for opportunities, given the uncertainty and given the risk of, of downside movement? Do you go, you know, fetal position defensive and buy something really, you know, low risk? Or, or how do you sort of navigate this sort of period? Really the time to do that. I'm not a trader, as you know, I'm really horrible at it. So I call it light being light and tight right now. You know, we're a long way. We're over a year into this, mm -hmm. into this bear market and fear of recession. Now is not the time to begin getting cautious. We would just rather maintain a higher level of cash than normal, mm -hmm. not get too defensive. Because Dave, as you know, you, you did it for a living. We all do it. You know, it's very hard to double buy when the market's in a swoon. Yeah. <laughs> I think the next push lower is, the, is going to be an important buying opportunity. If you're positioned too defensively, all you do is cover your defensive position. You don't get aggressive at the right time. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather be light in exposure and prepared to attack downside in the early cycle of names. Again, as long as the yield curves, the money outlook is improving because of Fed policy. And by Fed policy, I'm not talking about 
taking a pause. I'm not talking about the initial rate cut. I'm talking about cutting enough to steepen the yield curve to a point that money improves. Uh, and I, you and I both worked enough money managers. I know uh, talking to some of my for, former colleagues loved environments where the market was going, you know, sort of uh, deteriorating a bit. Opportunity to load up on good companies at a bargain. We may be setting up for that sort of environment based on what you're saying, Tony. Listen, awesome to see you. Thanks as always for making what you do seem so straightforward and so accessible to our viewers. And uh, be well there in New York. We'll see you soon, okay? Thanks a lot, Dave. Have a great day, everybody. That's Tony Dwyer. Tony's the chief market strategist at Canaccord Genuity. He's also the founder of the uh, Dwyer Strategy Report. Check that out for sure. He does a really good job. I always appreciated Tony and his work. He takes a, a ton of work and a ton of effort to understand the markets, but then boils it down to some very straightforward visuals and explanations that I've always found really, really illuminating. Interesting how some of our conversations this week have been less about raging bull, you know, lots of opportunities to a little more cautious, right? Jeff Hughes tapping the brakes, sort of, you know, thinking about downside potential. Tony showing us some of the uh, potential deterioration and, and just the recessionary signals that continue to show that conditions are tight here. Lending standards are uh, challenged. That usually is not a great sign for stocks. Great take there, as always, by Tony Dwyer. And folks, we need to wrap the show. Let's go to the three and three and hit on three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment Here's chart number one. I didn't get a chance to talk to, uh, to Tony too much about this, but before we went live, we were talking about small caps. We were talking about the narrow leadership, talking about how the mega cap tech consumer sort of fang stocks are really performing well. But the, you take those out of the picture and the, the market overall is kind of mixed flat to down, to be honest with you. One of the ways I think you can really show that discrepancy between strong indexes or at least stable indexes and weakness underneath the hood is by looking at the Russell 2000, which is the top half of this chart, and the S&P 500, which is the bottom half. Now you can see off of the October lows, both of them traded up to the 200-day moving average, both of them pulled back, and then in a resilient move of bullishness, made a new swing high into the first week in February. Both of them then retreated down to their 200-day moving average, and that's where the picture starts to change. The S&P 500 has bounced back to retest the February highs for now, failing to really push above there. But look at what's happened with small caps. Not only is it not near its previous high, hasn't even regained the 200-day moving average. So when I'm looking at a chart like small caps, I'm looking at charts like Home Depot and others that are trading lower and failing to hold resistance, trading, tra failing to regain new resistance levels, that's not a good sign for overall health underneath the hood of this market. So weakness in small caps, really not a good sign for uh, the markets as a whole. Having said that, there are some individual stocks that have been struggling. We saw how the, uh, the sectors uh, that are struggling today, things like consumer discretionary, technology, industrial. So here's a material name, uh, Albemarle, that came up on my scan for new swing lows this week, uh, down about 6% again today. And that's after trading lower for uh, the last week, to be honest with you. What's concerning about this is not only is it failing to hold resistance, it's actually breaking support. So again, if you look at the market and think of it as the S&P or the NASDAQ 100, you probably have one set or one perspective of how things are kind of hanging in there. Look at some of these individual names and it's a little bit tougher and we're seeing that with the chart of ALB here. Finally, there are charts out there that are working. I mentioned semiconductors, some gold stocks. Here's another one, CME. The financial sector is a tough sector, but a chart like this is actually working okay, right? Higher highs, higher lows. That's the sign of a strong trend. As long as that trend continues, I would be encouraged to actually follow these things higher. Now, think about the chart of the small cap uh, ETF. Think about the chart that I just showed you of ALB and think about how the chart of CME is different. That gets to what I think is the real benefit of the technical analysis toolkit is differentiating what's working to what's not. And by using our scanning engine, by using some of the great technical tools and visualizations we have available, you can key in on charts like CME that are breaking out, see what actually makes them a constructive chart and be able to manage your risk by using tools like support and resistance levels, our alert system, and things like the chandelier exit, which we have built into our platform as well. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank you so much as always joining us on the final bar on Stock Charts TV. Special thank you to Tony Dwyer of Canaccord Genuity joining us from uh, his firm in New York. All of our previous interviews can be found for free at StockChartsTV.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. It is filled with great expertise and insights. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow. 
Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.